Swinburne University of Technology. Hi everyone. In this video we are going to be looking at what we call multi-item scales. So a multi-item scale is a set of most commonly Likert scales, and for this course we're going to be using Likert scales, uh, which we combine a set of items together to try and measure an attitude or a perception or an underlying trait. So attitudes and perceptions are things that people think or feel and an underlying trait is commonly, uh, particularly in psychology we tend to use this quite a lot, uh, it can be things like depression or social anxiety or self-esteem. So these are things that are quite tricky for us to be able to measure just by asking a single question. So if we just said to someone, are you socially anxious, this is not going to give us a particularly reliable measurement. And particularly if we set it as a yes no question, uh, it's leaving it as very binary when in fact it's probably not just a yes no kind of thing. It's a more likely to be a continuum. So what we want to do is we want to combine multiple uh, statements together uh, with Likert scales attached to them. And we want to using the combination of these items uh, come up with measurements for these attitudes and perceptions and underlying traits. So we don't tend to use these for behaviors. If we are finding out about a behavior, we can normally ask questions like when and how often and what do you do to find out about behaviors, which is what people do. Instead, we're focusing on how people feel and what people think. So, got some examples there. Perception of safety, importance of appearance, concern for the environment. All of these are examples of what people think or how people feel and would be good examples of when we would use a multi-item scale. So, when we are writing our own multi-item scale, it's really important that we remember that the scale is measuring some sort of underlying perception or trait or concept. And so we want to have what we call a cohesive set. A cohesive set means that all of our items are measuring that same concept. And this means that they should all correlate with one another and they should also correlate with that underlying trait that we are trying to measure. When we are writing multi-item scales, every item should be a statement. It should never be a question, so they are always statements. The statements we should make sure do fit in with the options that are given. So if we give strongly disagree to strongly agree as our options for each item, we should make sure that the statements are ones that we can answer using those. Each statement should be a single idea, so it should not be double-barreled. If we have a double-barreled, uh, so double-barreled means there's more than two ideas to the statement, then people will get confused and will get poor data because they won't know whether they are agreeing to or disagreeing to one of the parts of the statement or the other or both or neither. So we need to make sure that a statement always is just a single idea. Final thing that's really important is distinguish what it is that's being measured. So for instance, if we are measuring the perception of safety, that's very different to measuring the importance of safety. So the perception of safety is trying to determine whether the person thinks that this particular thing we're talking about is safe. So all of our statements are going to be based around this thing is safe or not safe. And that's quite different from importance of safety where we're finding out about how they feel about it. So is it important to you that air travel or cars or walking around in the inner city is safe? So it's quite different of trying to determine whether they think it is safe from whether it's important to them that it is safe. So here we have an example of a multi-item scale. Uh, it's just a very small example. We can see uh, that it is what we call a four-point scale because we've got four different options, strongly agree, somewhat agree, somewhat disagree, strongly disagree. And you can see there's numbers attached to them, one, two, three, four. 
and you can see we have five statements there. And each of the statements uh, relates to gender and gender discrimination. And so this is probably, we, we would probably wouldn't regard this as a perfect scale. Um, when we're looking at each of these items, we would probably expect most of them to be correlated to one another. Um, so we would expect that if you strongly agreed uh, women are discriminated against, then you're probably going to also be agreeing to some of these other statements about women having more trouble getting good jobs or less opportunity. Um, so I'm not saying that this is certain, uh, certainly not saying that this is a, uh, a perfect set of items, uh, but it is an example of the kind of things that we might be using. When we look at some scales, and particularly some of the psychology scales, they use a lot more than five items. So it's not unusual for a psychology scale to have maybe, could be anywhere like 20 or 30 items uh, in order to get a really, really substantial measurement. For those of you that are studying psychology, you'll find that sometimes they even have subscales. So you might have your main scale, which is measuring uh, say depression or anxiety but within that certain components of the scale will be measuring certain components of depression or anxiety as well. So in practice if we were to be designing a multi-item scale what we would do is we'd start off uh, by thinking about what it is we want to measure. Uh, we would think about any theory related to that, so particularly for psychology, we'd be looking at uh, psychological theories. But the same for market research as well, we'd be looking at theory. We'd be looking to see if there's any secondary data uh, or any other uh, scales or studies that are already out there. We may even do a little bit of qualitative research, so we might interview, do some interviews or focus groups to really get a good handle on the kinds of statements that we want in our, in our multi-item scale. And then we'll come up with a big list of items. So we'll generate this pool of items and it'll, it'll be more than what we need. Because what we want to do is we want to narrow it down to the, the, the best and most useful items. Uh, we'll then perform what we call a pilot survey or a pilot study. And so a pilot study is normally a little testing study that we do. So we will make our survey or we will uh, make our scale and we'll distribute it and normally we won't be distributing it randomly, we'll be distributing it with actually a little bit of intent of uh, perhaps giving it to people who uh, may not be native English speakers or uh, may represent particular uh, demographic groups that we're interested in and we'll get them to complete our survey or our scale in order for us to see how well it is working. So with our scale we'd uh, collect some data and we would uh, then analyze it and in particular we'd be looking at correlations. So we'd be looking at relationships between the items and relationships to uh, our overall concept. And we'd use this as a way of working out which of the items are doing a good job or a not so good job of measuring what we're trying to find out about. So that would give us uh, some guidance for cutting some of the items out and then we go and we want to retest our scale and check it for the validity and reliability again. And if we've, we're still not happy, we might end up going through several iterations of this until we end up with a final scale. Okay, so the last thing we want to know about with these multi-item scales is creating what we call a score for the scale. So the whole idea of using the scale is that we're trying to measure some sort of perception or attitude or underlying trait and so each item within the scale is going to have a score so maybe it was number one one through five for strongly disagree to strongly agree and we want to combine all of these individual scores for all of the individual items into a single score so maybe it's a score for depression or depressive symptomology if we're being a little bit more technical or maybe it's a score for importance of safety when buying a car. Uh, so the first thing we would do is we would go through our items and we check for any that are what we call reverse scored. 
So a reverse scored item is where the wording is the opposite direction to the others. So for instance, if on most of our items saying strongly agree means you're very happy, we've got some sort of happiness scale, then any where a strongly disagree means happy, instead of numbering that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, we would treat those as 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, so that a 5 still equates to happy. So this isn't what we would be showing our participants, they would just see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 all the way down the page, but when we're doing our scoring we'd reverse these so that all the numbers were consistent, so 1's meant unhappy, 5's meant happy. Then once we'd done this, uh, we would get our numbers for each of our individual items, and the most common way of getting a score is just to get the average of these. So calculate the mean, add them all up, divide by how many there are. Uh, some scales use a total instead of an average. The nice thing with the average is that it gives us a number which we can relate back to the original scale. So if I, we had our happiness index and we averaged all the scores and a person got a 4.5, and we'd established that 5 meant happy, then our, our uh, multi-item scale would be indicating this particular person was quite happy. Whereas someone else, if they had an average of maybe 1.7, then we would be saying, well, they're probably quite unhappy. So the total would tell us the same story, a bigger total, happier the person, uh, but the nice thing with the averages is that we can relate it back to the original strongly disagree to strongly agree. This has been a Swinburne production.